Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. We have today what we'll hope, we hope to be a very edifying and informative episode. It's going to be our longest episode to date, uh, running right about three hours. So grab a glass of wine, settle in, and chill out. Before I introduce our three guests, let me set up the conversation. Young Earth creationism, theistic evolution, evolution, Darwinism. These are terms around which many diverse opinions revolve. The subject of the age of the earth, the means through which man became man, and the question of our, of our descent from a common genetic ancestor can evoke passionate and often heated discourse among Christians. Terms like liberal or accusations of intellectual inferiority can usually find their way into the conversation. For some, the matter is easily resolved by simply taking Genesis 1 through 11 as a straightforward and literal historical account of God making all things. For others, the interpretation of Genesis 1 through 11 is not so easily discerned, and combined with the geological evidence we have discovered throughout advances in the sciences, leaves some Christians with questions that are not so easily answered. One Christian philosopher in particular has written a book recently trying to answer some of these questions. William Lane Craig's new book, In the Quest for the Historical Adam, a Biblical and Scientific Exploration, looks at the text of the Bible and the evidence found in scientific inquiries to try and resolve some of the tensions involved in this conversation. Review copies were obtained, and today we will use Craig's book as a springboard into a conversation orbiting some of the points that he made. Let me introduce uh, our partners for discussion today. Uh, Shane Morris is a senior writer at the Colson Center and host of the Upstream podcast, as well as co-host of the Breakpoint podcast with John Stone Street. He has also written for the Gospel Coalition, the Federalist, Summit Ministries, and the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. He lives with his wife, Gabriella, and their three children in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, Shane used to be my neighbor that lived five minutes down the street until he didn't want me to be in his neighborhood anymore, so I had to move. Hmm. Brad Belschner is just some dude whose existence we are thankful for. But other than that, I don't know why we invited him. He's also a smart man and has thought very deeply about these questions for years. And uh, Belschner has actually been uh, one, of the, one of the men in my life that I've gone to, the, outside of Joe, the most on questions I have revolving around this subject. Um, very trusted man. Seraphin Hamilton uh, is an Orthodox Christian interested in the deep unity of Scripture, Christian apologetics, and the beauty of Christ revealed in creation. He has a master's in early Christian studies from the University of Notre Dame and a master of theology from Duke University. He makes videos at his channel, Seraphin Hamilton, which can be found at youtube.com backslash Cabane. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Um, this has been a conversation that's been in the works for um, months now. And so uh, in God's good providence, brothers, here we are, and hopefully we can have a fruitful discussion. So now that I've sort of set up the conversation of what we want to talk about, um, the first thing I'd like to do is just go around uh, the panel and get everyone's uh, per their own introduction. Talk to us about where you stand in the debate, old earth, young earth, theistic evolution. Uh, Joe, I know, has a tattoo of Darwin on his left shoulder, so he can tell us a little bit more about that. Um, <laughs> and, and after we do that, I've got a series of questions, a total of nine questions that we'll try to work through over the course of the next three hours. And uh, this, the series of questions are divided into three categories. So we'll talk about hermeneutics, how do we read our Bible? anthropology, the study of man, uh, and then other doctrines, which is just a lazy way of saying we don't know how to categorize this, so let's just other doctrines. That's Belchner's fault. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to keep some order to the conversation. I want this to be free-flowing. Pilgrim faith really is just a conversation with people about cool stuff. Uh, so feel free to, you know, ask for clarity or interrupt someone if they're just rambling and, and you'd like to move the conversation forward. Um, that will be my role. I'll try to sort of keep us moving uh, towards the end of the discussion. Um, and I will uh, begin the, the 
history of where I'm at and where I'm coming from, uh, because I'm actually not going to be a very involved conversation partner, but I'll tell you why. Um, so after I give you my um, background on this subject, we'll go over to uh, Mr. Sarah from Hamilton and then Shane Morris and then Brad Belchner and Dr. Joseph Minnick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think my story is like a lot of conservative evangelicals. I grew up in a very conservative Christian home uh, with McGee and me um, and uh, the James Award. Uh, and I actually never even knew there was a thing outside of a literal six day creation understanding of the beginning of all things uh, until I started to um, really take responsibility for my own faith and begin to study the Christian tradition with uh, genuine intellectual curiosity. Did I start to bump into other uh, understandings of Genesis 1 through 11 um, and different theories about uh, the descent from Adam and Eve and even what Adam and Eve were, or if Ab Adam and Eve even were a thing. Um, and that was sort of shocking to my, um, my, not my faith, it was just sort of jarring to the whole structure of what had been given to me by mom and dad. And I met those with sort of visceral denial. Uh, I remember, you know, thinking if you don't believe that God created the world in six literal 24 hour days, you're not a Christian. You're something else because Christians believe what is obviously right here in Genesis. Um, and I think there's a lot of, I'm 37, so I'm first wave of millennials. I think there's a lot of uh, folks out there like me that grew up in conservative Christian homes who maybe relate to that. Uh, but I know there's a lot that don't. Um, so where am I on the whole thing? I still retain that, uh, the, the, the doctrines that I received from my mother and my grandmother uh, on the understanding of Genesis and the creation uh, narrative. I take it as a literal 24 hour um, cycle for God to complete his creative work. Uh, however, I'm open to hearing, and this part of, part of this was because I know the conversation can be had in amicable ways. Uh, part of this conversation was an attempt at trying to show people, number one, you can actually do that. Uh, and if you do that, you might find that you don't know nearly as much as you might think you know about the thing that you so dogmatically hold on to. Uh, and if Christians are anything, we're people of truth. We worship God who is truth. Uh, and no matter where that takes you, you should be willing to go, even if it clashes against your sort of traditional understanding of things. Um, so I'm sort of in, I wouldn't say limbo. I would uh, still, you know, proudly stake my flag in the six day creationist camp and say, I believe this. And uh, the reasons that I believe this is because I take Genesis as a true historical account of what God was doing. Um, so that's where I'm at. Uh, and as such, I'm, don't want to open my mouth about things that I don't know. So I will just sort of be being, uh, I'll be, I'll MC this conversation. And if I have questions, I'll have the privilege of asking it whenever I want, because I can mute people. Uh, but I, I want to hear your history and, and how you came to believe what you believe now. And uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Sarah from Hamilton. Talk to us, brother. Thank you. So uh, you made a joke about uh, Dr. Joseph Minnick having a tattoo of Darwin. But actually, when I was a teenager, I really did have a picture of Darwin hanging in the corner of my room. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I was uh, I was raised in a kind of an evangelical home, but it was a weird evangelical home in that my dad is not a Christian. Um, you know, he's the, the most righteous of righteous pagans, uh, but he's a deist. Mm -hmm. And my mom converted to evangelicalism when I was three years old. So the awareness that there was such a thing as a non-Christian and a person who didn't actually believe that it was true was always kind of taken for granted in my wiring. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a strange idea for me. But being raised in an evangelical home, I was raised with a, you know, a six-day creationist understanding Standing. Um, and I know Shane has had a, uh, had, has a similar experience um, of having the image of dinosaurs millions and millions of years ago in your mind and having the image of Adam and Eve about 6,000 years ago in your mind. And then one day 
realizing, wait a second, these two things don't actually go together. What's the deal? Um, but when I was 13 years old, um, I became, it's just one of those things you kind of latch on to as a, as a young teenager. I became an intense theistic evolutionist. I went to a small Christian school um, and I would introduce myself by saying, what do you think about evolution? They'd say, oh, I don't believe in that. I said, well, you're wrong about that. And here's why you're yeah. wrong. And, and eventually it got so tiring in person that I got on YouTube and I started telling people why they were wrong on YouTube. So I've helpfully deposited the uh, uh, my 13 year old self into the collective consciousness of the human race <laughs> through the internet. Uh, uh, so, so so that had a huge influence on my life, though, because that brought me into contact with um, not just non-Christians in an abstract sense, but people who were very aggressively non-Christian. And that kind of made it a very concrete issue. Why do I believe that Christianity is true? And I had a very kind of I Christianity was very important to me because of the person of Jesus, regardless of what I did or didn't understand about the theological issues. I still remain impressed today by how many people when they go off to college will give up Christianity after two weeks, because for me, when all seemed lost, it was kind of a devastating experience. But that brought mm. me into the realm of apologetics. It got me into theology, um, got me into a whole range of things. But one thing, as I kind of clawed my way back to a confident faith, um, kept nagging at me that again and again, I would find that this or that problem with Christianity would be resolved. This or that question would be answered. Oftentimes, I'd be looking at something completely unrelated, and then I'd find the question would be answered. But the evolution issue just wasn't moving. The things that I kind of marked off to be problems to be resolved in the future, they weren't getting better, they were getting worse. The more I understood about theological questions, the more I understood about scripture, the worse the issues got, the more sharply the disjunction appeared between the conventional understanding of the history of the world and uh, uh, the biblical narrative, and then the theological implications of that narrative. Um, and one issue is that, you know, having spent a few years uh, uh, obsessed with the evolution issue and then having retained an interest in it um, ever afterwards, including to this day, not just in a negative sense, um, I knew that most creationist arguments were absolute bogus. And I will still stand by that to this day as a doctrinaire six day creationist. There's no worse critic of creationism than creationists themselves to demonstrate to the entire world that they have no clue what they're talking about, either with respect to the science or with respect to what's actually going on in the mind of a theistic evolutionist. You know, oh, you're just a compromiser. You're just interested in liberal theology. Because I knew that I wanted to be a creationist, but I just couldn't bring myself to that position. In 2014, got really into the biblical theology of a gentleman named James B. Jordan uh, and uh, uh, his friend Peter Lightheart. And that really introduced me to a whole new world where all scripture being inspired by God and profitable was more than just an aspect of our confession. It was a living truth which uh, permeated every letter of the biblical text, where every letter of the biblical text having its place where it is actually had implications for the way we read it and what it says about Christ. And that underscored to me the profound unity of the Bible, the way that it's not just Romans 5 and Romans 8, and then a few passages from the Gospels, and then a few bits from Proverbs, and then Genesis 1 to 3, of course, but actually Leviticus 12. Leviticus 12 has lots to say about Jesus. Uh, and all of these obscure passages about scripture came to uh, constellate around the person of Christ. And as I kind of lived in the Bible and lived in the world, the two kind of came together. And the disjunction, which had existed in my mind between the two, was resolved. And so as my confidence in the divine inspiration of scripture increased dramatically, the epistemic weight of Genesis 1 to 11 proportionately increased. So when the inerrancy of scripture is kind of a very weighty reality, when I actually believed that this is the word of God, that it's actually saying something that is binding on me, and I have confidence and grounds for that confidence, well, then that raises questions about maybe I should take this a bit more seriously. Maybe if the problems aren't resolving themselves, maybe I've made a mistake at the point of origin in taking for granted the scientific consensus. Um, and so I became more and more skeptical of the academic consensus 
because of my experience with biblical criticism and just the uh, experienced reality that people who spend their life studying the Old Testament often know less when they end than when they started. And that decreased my confidence in the ability of academic consensuses to indicate uh, truth in a reliable way. Um, and then uh, in fall of 2014, actually, I it was on Shane's Facebook, he shared a, a Facebook post about flood stories from around the world. And so I started to actually go through them. And I bought books on with the primary sources. And I realized that the kind of explanations on the secular account of things for why almost every culture has a flood story just weren't working. And they were not even well thought out. They were just kind of, oh, floods happen everywhere. So of course that, that, that explains it, or it's just missionaries. Well, I don't think that missionaries were in old world India in 700 BC and floods happen everywhere doesn't work there because uh, the flood hero does not send a raven out from the ship everywhere in the world. That doesn't make sense on an independent origin explanation for why there are these stories. And that was true across the whole of Genesis 1 to 11, stories like that for uh, the creation of Adam and Eve, there are stories like that for the creation of Abel. And that made it a very concrete reality that, wait a second, this is the actual history of the human race. This is real. That's the world that we're living in. And there's a common memory of that distributed across the world. And so kind of one afternoon, I remember I'd been struggling with the issue for a while, and I just found that I believed in six day creation. It wasn't like a choice. It was a kind of after a long sleep, I woke up and stepped into the real world again. Um, and so since then, and, and since I was a theistic evolutionist for, uh, for a time, I feel like I have, and this isn't meant to sound condescending, um, intellectual empathy. What I mean by that is I understand what it's like to be a theistic evolutionist and I understand why creationism looks so silly from the outside. And so um, a lot of people uh, are very interested in becoming creationists if they can find intellectual grounds for that. So I feel like some of the stuff that I've, I've been able to say um, has been has been helpful to that. Um, so I'm just uh, uh, I'm very energetic about this issue because I feel like mm -hmm. it makes scripture it makes christianity much more concretely real it makes the truth of god's involvement with the world a much more sharply edged reality than just kind of an abstract well god created things and you know the scripture tells us the why and uh, or scripture tells yeah scripture tells us the why science tells us the how no i mean the, the world is not that old it's six thousand years ago God is very, very tightly engaged with, with the creation. And, um, and I think it's, it's uh, creation's beauty is really accentuated when we understand how intimately he is involved with the shape of every single leaf. So that's my. Mm. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. That uh, continuity of uh, flood stories. Um, I read a book called uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Have you ever read that, Sarah? No, oh, you got to check it out. But he draws a, he draws, he shows the continuity of stories in a whole bunch of different ways, and that's how we got the hero's journey. So, I understand the pool of that. So, very good. All right, uh, Gregory Shane Morris, talk to us about uh, where you're at. How'd you get? How'd you get there? And um, yeah, go ahead, brother. Well, thanks, brother. Um, this was a podcast that I would. You know, I was initially very interested in taking part in because it's an issue that keeps coming up in my life and something that um, I inevitably end up talking with people largely because of my hobbies and fascinations. Um, so if you follow me on social media, if you uh, get to know me at all, you'll find that I am a collector of fossils, specifically uh, giant fossilized shark teeth. The megalodon is extinct. It's gone. It does not exist anymore, but um, its <laughs> teeth are still everywhere, especially where I live here in Florida. So I go scuba diving for those. Uh, and that's an outgrowth of a lifelong fascination with uh, ancient extinct monsters that uh, began really when I was a small child. I can't remember the exact genesis of it. It might have been the fact that uh, my grandparents gave me a copy of The Land Before Time, which came out the year after I was born. So, um, you know, that may have sharp tooth and little foot may have been the inception. Did of you that. follow your heart, Shane? Yes. And I had a tree star that I took along with me. Yeah. It, you know, that sort of stuck in my imagination and I followed it through all the other dinosaur products. And one day, um, you know, my dad came home from work and he said, Hey, there's this new dinosaur movie out in the theaters. And at this point, I guess I was like five years old. And he said, uh, um, do you want to go see it? It's called Jurassic park. And uh, I said, sure, I want to see it. I was playing with a dinosaur toy at the time. Um, he took me to see this needless to say, I spent the entirety of the movie in his lap, like, mm. 
you know, hiding because this was way scarier than I expected um, <laughs> after the boring adult talking part ended. But uh, that was sort of like that grew into loving fossils and just being interested in drawing all this stuff. And, um, and that ran parallel with a very sort of thorough, devout, involved Christian upbringing. So I was raised Southern Baptist. I remember getting baptized in front of this, this big uh, Southern Baptist mega church, but very traditional. So, um, you know, it was like the, the kind of place where um, the worship leader is also like the guy who organizes the potlucks and he looks every bit the part. Um, mm. That was, that was kind of how I was raised. And I was baptized in front of all these people and on my profession of faith and, and all that stuff. And at some point, like Sarah was saying, I, I noticed that there was a contradiction because I had just read the dinosaur books that mom and dad got me. And I took for granted everything that they said, um, you know, I was kind of quoting these extensive dates of deep time, um, you know, hundreds of millions of years into the Mesozoic that these creatures lived. And at some point, I guess I or mom and dad noticed the contradiction there between this and, and what we're reading in scripture. And eventually they stumbled across the, you know, various young earth creationist organizations and, it, um, you know, answers in Genesis was involved in there, but I think to a large extent, it was much smaller outfits um, that were local to where we were that uh, brought me into a lot of that stuff. And I just became like this zealous devotee of all that um, and became, that would became my sitting position for a long, long time until I guess at some point I began to encounter more serious challenges to that. Um, and became fascinated with theology at the same time uh, as a, like as something I needed to pursue more deeply. And this is when I began to question some of my beliefs about soteriology and the sacraments and the church and history and all of that. And it flowed out of that because I found these two camps, like there were people who basically said, oh yeah, yeah, you know, you can reconcile the Bible very handily with modern science. There's no conflict. Please don't say there's a conflict. I'm scared of the idea that there's a conflict. You know, there's there's kind of an attitude there um, that you you encounter, and then there's the other side, which is just like this is uh, this is required belief. You must be at thorough uh, loggerheads with the modern scientific consensus. And um, you know, I had I had sort of brushed that aside when I first encountered it as a kid um, with the the little church down the street, not my church, where the kids that I met said dinosaurs didn't exist. You know, Satan put them in the ground, and and that was kind of like the, the, the extreme caricature of whatever fundamentalist beliefs you could find. So I had these two like intuitive loves of two different things. I loved the natural world, which began with a fascination with extinct animals. And I loved um, scripture and the story of Christianity, not just as like a personal faith that can, that can mm -hmm. give you a sort of pious outlet for your um, your spiritual longings, but as an actual world picture and story, something that should totally shape the entirety of your the entirety of your life and drive you towards certain ends and be the the source of your thoughts and motivations and loves all throughout your um, days and years. And so, um, I continued to sort of wrestle with that conflict, not at, not seriously questioning young Earth creationism, but getting into a deeper levels of it. And that's that's when I met. Um, seraphim and began to talk more deeply about this and he was a, he was one of a number of conversation partners who pointed me towards some of the more um some of the more robust and scientifically serious young earth thinkers um guys like kurt wise todd wood paul garner um and then of course a lot of this stuff got brought together a few years ago by del tackett in a documentary called is genesis history and I knew Del Tackett personally. He was a professor at, um, they call him professors, instructor at the Focus on the Family Institute because I'm a good Christian boy and I went to the Focus on the Family <laughs> yeah. college. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that is where my um, lay level fascinations with this kind of stuff converged and led to ongoing conversations and slash debates with a lot of other guys who are interested in theology, but um, have a very, different view of this whole thing. One thing that I'll, I'll note that has been like a controlling assumption or, well, two things that have been controlling assumptions and motivations for me as I look at this issue. Number one is that I do not believe, in fact, I'm firmly convinced that um, your worldview must not be just a wall. It must not be a defensive structure that's put up for the sole purpose of repelling 
skeptical attacks. In other words, you should not choose your theological convictions on the basis of what is easiest to defend in a debate with an atheist. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of Christians go down that road. They say, well, if it's easiest to defend against Richard Dawkins, say, or uh, Sam Harris, then I, it must be the truth, or at least I must be obligated to hold that. I happen to think that thing, some things that are true um, would cause the wisdom of this world to laugh. And so that's one core conviction. I, I don't think that's how we should choose our beliefs. Um, number two, I think that your Christianity must be concretely real. And I'm not trying to psychoanalyze anyone I'm, I'm, other than myself. So consider this like introspection. I find that when I be, have moments of doubt about the historicity, reliability, and truth of scripture and the Christian story, um, I have a temptation to consign it to some spiritual realm in order to protect it from criticism. So I want to say, oh, oh, well, okay, maybe this passage is really just about some spiritual truths that we need to hold to. And, um, and that way it's beyond criticism and nobody can get to it and say, well, this just didn't happen. It doesn't matter if it happened because you know the ancients didn't think that way anyway. They didn't care about historicity. They just cared about the spiritual meaning of stuff, which is a line you'll hear all the time. Um, and so I'm going to put it out here in the realm of, of um, dream time and not let anyone touch it. And there's a there's superficial comfort to that because you don't have to face a lot of those really hard criticisms about whether this is historically uh, tenable. But I think ultimately it um, it's an acid that eats through the faith and and divorces it from the real world. So I think that our faith should be rooted. Um, that's not to deny you know the different genres in scripture, but our faith should be rooted in a literal historical set of events somewhere at some time. And we should talk about what those events are and why we need to believe them. So that's that's kind of my process and background. Very good. Thank you, brother. It's been fascinating to listen to how you talk to the people you sell your shark teeth to. Um, because they're like, what date? And you got to be, you know, because of your convictions, you, yeah. you, you're clever in the way that you market. So bravo. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Bradley uh, Belschner, talk to us about where you're coming from and where you're at. Yes. So I'm an old earth creationist. I'm not a Darwinist or neo-Darwinist um, uh, in the sense that I don't think that random chance generates all these life forms or anything like that. I'm much more of a neo-Lamarckian when it comes to biology. So I, I would currently affirm a, a tree of life uh, in the sense of that evolution, uh, things evolving, but evolving non-randomly in a Lamarckian way, <clears throat> which is not at all the normal biological consensus on things. Um, I was raised young earth creationist. I was raised in a godly evangelical household and I was really into it. I really enjoyed it and, and loved it growing up. Um, my Christmas and birthday wish lists were always populated with young earth literature. Um, <clears throat> I especially liked Kurt Wise um, and it was, it was a uh, not just a matter either of trying to own the libs or something like that because of the young earth creations. I just really enjoyed it for its own sake. Um, I've always been drawn to the study of origins. Uh, in my early 20s, though, I got a job selling shares in oil wells. I sold shares in Oklahoma and Texan oil wells to investors. And as part of my job, I incidentally ended up learning a lot more about petroleum geology, studying petroleum geology textbooks and meeting with Christian um, petroleum geologists in Texas and learning that they use old earth theories. Um, they use these narratives and theories to successfully predict where oil is pretty much. And mm -hmm. that surprised me and I didn't have a way to think about that or explain that very well. It resulted in me uh, reanalyzing a bunch of questions, uh, arguments that I had accepted too quickly as uh, arguments in favor of a young earth. I ended up revisiting them and after a few years ended up 
becoming an old earther. And I didn't affirm an old earth because I thought that Genesis taught it. Uh, for nine years, I've been trying to um, find a good interpretation of Genesis that was compatible with an old earth. And I have been failing for nine years. Uh, my thinking has been, well, the, the natural science seems unyielding here. It seems like there's only one way to interpret what these rocks are saying. They don't say a whole lot, but what they do say is pretty clear and pretty simple and pretty old. And uh, setting aside the more complex details of old earth theories, uh, what they all have in common is these things are old. There's a lot of history here. There's a lot of layers, a lot of narrative, a lot of details here. Um, it's not compatible with a young earth perspective. Uh, and therefore I was thinking, well, literature is complicated. Um, I've either mis clearly I've either misinterpreted the natural science or I've misinterpreted Genesis. I'm going to bet that I've misinterpreted Genesis because literature tends to be complicated. And hey, I've misinterpreted literature before. You know, I used to be a pre-millennial. It turns out those prophecies were partly fulfilled in 70 AD, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So for nine years, I've been kind of suspended midair in my Genesis interpretation, trying to find a good one and not having done that yet. Um, I do affirm an historical Adam, uh, which we'll get into more later in this conversation. <clears throat> I even affirm uh, an anthropologically universal Noah's flood and Tower of Babel in the sense that I think all of humanity had to have been killed in the flood and had to have been at the Tower of Babel. Um, I loc locate those things currently in the distant past, not just a few thousand years ago. Um, but I got to say, I have a lot of respect for young earth creationism and the young earth third uh, stances and those scientists. I have respect for them because they are the ones who respect the Bible more, generally speaking. They're the ones who are um, willing to be contrarian and not be cool. <clears throat> they are the ones who are, uh, they're exhibiting the qualities that we should be striving for as Christians today, for the most part. And uh, I'm not currently a young earther. I'm, I'm tentatively old earther, but I might be wrong about that. And I'm open to being wrong about that. Uh, the longer I go without finding a good interpretation of Genesis, the more open I am to <laughs> revisiting my opinions on the science and thinking, you know, maybe the world is just seven and a half thousand years old. Um, not mm. not 6,000 incidentally, because I think the Septuagint's numbers on Genesis 5 are more accurate than the Masoretic text, but that's a different conversation. Um, right. And I am not the sort of guy who cares about scientific consensus or popularity or uh, respect uh, among the secular scientists or anything like that, clearly. I mean, uh, I otherwise I would be a neo-Darwinist or something. I Currently, I would, I would be an old earther if I was the only old earther in the world because I just care about what the science seems to be saying, what these rocks seem to be implying. And to me, I can't currently avoid the conclusion that the world is old, um, yeah. but I might be wrong. I also wanna add, if this is an issue that you are struggling with spiritually, like if this is actually like a crisis sort of question for you, then please do not listen to me or <laughs> maybe even please don't listen to the rest of this podcast. Just talk to your pastor and probably just go be a plain old young earther because that's a nice, traditional, safe, reliable position where you're definitely going to be respecting the Bible and not being cool and things like that. So um, I am not a teacher. I am someone who's having an open and curious conversation here. Um, so uh, there's that disclaimer. Your soul is not in my hands. God heard me say that. Like you're on your own here figuring this out. I'm not trying to lead you. <laughs> the warning on the cigarette package here. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Evolution kills. Yeah. Um, now, I also, I'm, so I got one of uh, these books for free. This uh, William Lane Craig's book on the historical Adam here, the publisher sent me one for free. So I do want to say at least a little bit about that book. Uh, because I want to do good by the publisher and, you know, earn my free copy. 
Um, I don't want to talk about it much in the rest of the podcast, but I do want to say a bit about it now. Uh, I do think it's a particularly good contribution to the historical Adam discussion. It's way better than the other books that I've read on the subject, but it's still so disappointing to me and so lame. And <clears throat> if you're the sort of guy who's just got to read all the books on Origins, like you got to catch all the Pokemon, then obviously you should read this book. Um, but if you're also, if you're the sort of guy who reads BioLogos and thinks like, hmm, I better read these BioLogos articles, they're interesting, they're valuable, then you should definitely read this book. It's a breath of fresh air because of how uh, conservative he ends up being. He ends up being sensible about affirming, uh, say, the New Testament's stance on an historical Adam. And there are also lots of interesting tidbits here and there throughout the book. But if you're a young earther who's just interested in maybe wanting to learn more about like, oh, maybe, maybe there, maybe this Adam stuff is more complicated than my young earth opinions are inclined to say, then don't like, don't bother with this book. It's not that good of a book. It's, it's really just a book that is surprisingly conservative by BioLogos standards and pretty disappointing and lame by young earther standards. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, brother. You know, um, you mentioned your interest in biology, and uh, I can testify to um, Brad Belschner has helped me almost more than any of the doctors I have ever met understand my body. Uh, Belschner is the guy that I call when I'm like, hey, there's something weird going on. And I explain it. And he's like, oh, yeah, just, you know, drink, some, shoot some prune juice into your eyeball. And no, <laughs> <laughs> that's not one of the things. Is, is, no, I know. <laughs> the idea for the, the red lights basking in the red lights. Yeah. Yes, 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 okay. yes. The, the red lights. We won't talk, about, actually... we won't talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Adam so, did it. Oh, yeah. so thank, thank you, Bradley. I appreciate it. Okay, could I just, Doctor Minnick? Could I say, yeah, of course, um, of course. If, if you're struggling with this issue on a spiritual level, uh, what you really should do is you should pick a psalm and you should pray that every day for 40 days and ask God to help you with it. I mean, when, if people come to me and they say, I'm really struggling with this, I need to talk to you. I say, I'll talk to you, but I want you to pray this for two weeks. Nine times out of 10, by the end of those two weeks, they will say, I'm feeling much better. God has worked it out for me. So just, if you're listening to this podcast for that reason, pick a psalm, pray it for 40 days. God will answer. Hmm. Yeah. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful advice. Amen. All right. Dr. Joseph Minnick, talk to us. Where, where are you at? Uh, well, it's, just, you it's, it's funny to hear all these stories because it's, 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 we're in some ways landing in very different places, but I share so many of the values I'm hearing. I share some of the background and so much of my own frustration uh, with, I think, kind of an old earth perspective, and especially those who take a more, uh, even a Lamarckian evolution perspective, which I might be, you know, sympathetic toward. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, very often, I'm, ju I'm just frustrated with the degree to which the Bible is sort of just engineered as it were, into the, like, science is clear, the Bible's not, and the Bible just gets kind of plugged in somehow. Uh, my own story, I guess, will get you to my own epistemic status on all of these questions. I mean, like, like I, I suppose most people in this room, I was raised in a home where young earth creation, and in a community where young earth creation was the default. Uh, I was just talking to my wife this morning, which is funny, and I was talking to her about her experience of being a, a homeschooler in the 90s in Maryland versus my experience being a homeschooler in the 90s in the Dallas area, which was kind of one of the meccas of sort of a homeschooling movement, you might say, in the 90s. And along with that, in my community was, I think, a, a particularly... I say particularly, that might be overstating it, but a, but a relatively significant vocal, like in my community of, you know, your, your homeschool co-ops and that sort of thing, young earth creation is what you could expect to be taught by the biology professor at the local, local co-op. That was just part of my world. And I mostly just assumed evolution must be stupid and all of these other, you know, and, and not to mention evil. In fact, probably they're aware that it's stupid, but because, you know, they hate Jesus and whatever, you know, they're making it all work out in their textbooks or something. Uh, you know, that was effectively my impression. I, I suppose I started to get skeptical that that's how it all worked out somewhat by contact with some, you know, you're not that I knew Kent Hovind at the time, but just seeing your kind of Ken Ham style character, I think gave me an allergy like that 
this doesn't seem like intellectual honesty to me. I think there was an innate like this, th th just the level of credibility is a bit off here. But then you, you know, what it was part of, however, I think what, what sort of crumbled the edifice, if you will, it is a default for me, was that in my context, I think young earth creationism was one of many uh, kinds of ways in which Christians and especially people with their Christian worldview, as it were, kind of had their distinctive thing. Uh, you know, sort of like there was a Christian economics to be had. There was the secular medicine versus the Christian homeopathic medicine. Now they, you know, well, I won't go there. <laughs> That's not what this is about. Uh, there was, you know, secular American history versus David Barton and his American history. And young earth creationism to me was just one of that kind of sandwich of things where we all had secular science versus this, you know, versus Christian, the Christian worldview leading to these conclusions, you know, that kind of thing. That very quickly, I think early in my development, it was clear to me nothing is that neat. It, it it like it doesn't slice up that neatly in any of these fields. A lot of the guys we're claiming as our own are very unreliable, and it makes me nervous to see what mass appeal these things have and the intellectual damage. Really, like in my conscience, I couldn't get over like this is damaging to the soul of people when we're actually saying this is this is smart. And it's just not, it really is not. And it's not curious about reality. And so that more or less, I think, kind of broke my attachment to all of those things. But what replaced it, even though I went into the secular university and got a PhD at a very woke, you know, you, you know, uh, public university, I don't think I ever lost a, a good homeschoolers, uh, 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 you know, you can take the boy out of the, the movement, but you can't take, take the whatever out of the boy. I don't think mm. I ever lost the kind of like, but that doesn't mean consensus is always true. I never lost the idea that you look, elite things can be totally wrong. University, and I've been intimate enough at this point with a university and seen how institutions work a little bit more and even how the sciences work a little bit. And that has not lessened my <laughs> skepticism that, you know, these things can fire wrongly. Nevertheless, the resolution of these issues has to ultimately, it, it, however, I also don't look at all those institutions just to add all of that to, to kind of give the big picture where I'm coming from. I also don't look at those uh, uh, channels of knowledge as intrinsically, is automatically suspicious either. Rather, I'm aware that they can deliver mass information. Uh, I can, I'm aware that they can deliver mass good information. Uh, uh, but I don't, I don't know which is which because I don't know the things themselves. And so for me, the debate, it, it became less about elites and systems and this team versus that team. And it's just, what does this text of the Bible teach? What does this text of nature teach? How do I... Uh, what are the smart voices that are not being ideological? They're not trying to fight. You know, they're not trying to do something apocalyptic with this. They really are just trying to stare honestly at the rocks and stare honestly at these words on the page and come to a conclusion. And I think maybe where I, f I feel the, that this is over, uh, feel, maybe where I feel I'm a little bit different, I think, than what I've heard so far is that I don't think I ever, I'm just speaking for myself here, not saying this is righteous, I don't think I ever felt after that an attraction to young earth creationism as solving a problem for me because I don't, I think it was, it was never my reading of Genesis that the six day creation position was the default reading of the text and that I had to find another interpretation to make work with what I found on the page. Mm. Immediately, I think after losing that attachment, I read Genesis and rather, I find myself staring at uh, what I suspect I'd find if I was staring at marine biology. I know kind of what I'm seeing here, but there's a lot that I, I just, I'm not even sure what this is doing for its readers. So I read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. I never lost the idea this is history. It always struck me as this is people interested in writing down, uh, I think, uh, a Sarah from Sarah's, uh, comment was just right, deep, deep common historical memory. But I think once you take and play with that category and then begin to really imagine, and I think somebody like a C.S. Lewis tried to do this a lot, really imagine what it is like to be a human 15,000 years ago. 
what would you say and how would you say it to record actual events? How would you record actual events if you were trying to preserve them across oral traditions and generations and then ultimately text, that sort of thing? And so that became the kind of lens through which I began to look at Genesis 1 to 11, maybe what were the, the truly original context of a lot of these things? Why would you write it this way? How does that relate to events versus symbolism, et cetera? And it seemed to me like that, that approach is rewarding seems to me like it's in some ways relatively traditional there's a lot about to talk about there in the sciences i I think this is the other side of it Uh, bradley is more learned than me on this question (laughs) and most questions (laughs) but uh (laughs) on, on the sciences side of things i think i was always very frustrated with the the, 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 the moving target feeling that I found in a lot of quote, quote, young earth creationism science, and also I think a very bad philosophy of science. So I am not the science guy who's going to sit here and talk about, you know, does the, how does this fossil relate to this fossil and what are all the arguments between that? That's not it. But the how do we in principle, like asking the question, like what would constitute evidence for an old earth? If the earth was old, what would persuade you that it was old? Asking questions like that seemed to have always seemed to me to be ones that really reveal where are we actually coming from here? Uh, what 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 constitutes here's a good a good one for me that has be, just been an allergy what and we could apply this to the text as well what constitutes uh what are the actual characteristics of a good theory uh, uh, uh what are the characteristics in particular of a good scientific theory and it seemed to me in the discourse i was aware of that not only was that discussed in a shallow way uh uh, very bad theoretical foundations were were kind of the, 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 you know I think of John Sanford's uh, genetic entropy in the mystery of the human genome here you know heralded by young earth creationists is this you know kind of really smart thing a lot of them there are exceptions but as I was reading it I'm like the the, the philosophy of science foundations of the way you are approaching this topic are 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 manifestly and scandalously bad. <laughs> and, and a lot of people can't see that kind of thing. And so, but law, I'm going to end here, long winded thing, uh, to, I'll stop a way to get to nevertheless, I don't, I'm not attracted to the young earth creation position. I don't, I don't feel it jumping off the page of the text to me in that sense. I don't even feel a need to resolve anything. Uh, but there's a, there's, you know, there's an apparent tension here there's lots of ways in which I think we can move toward uh, uh, alleviating some of that apparent tension. I actually think the real solutions are probably more imaginative and, and, and not, I'm not persuaded that they're entirely thought <laughs> actually mm. uh, for various reasons. Uh, but I, I have great respect for a lot of six day creationists. Uh, I don't think it's an intrinsically dumb position or something like that. I think there are people who hold it in good faith and I'm attracted to some of the reasoning and the, the epistemic commitments that, that yield. And, and so I, I, the other allergy I guess I have, I'm trying to say on the other side is uh, <laughs> I'm invested in enough weird hot takes about reality and share uh, Saro and and, and uh, Shane and Brad's desire to be in reality for Christianity and the Bible and all of its pieces to be real, to actually be bankable upon, <laughs> and the mm-hmm. actual fine grain textures of reality. That um, uh, I I don't want to dismiss my brethren and say like oh they're just dumb and you know they're not being honest with the science blah 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 people know more about this than I do for sure. Uh, there's good guys out there on both sides of the fence. And that's largely what today's about really is like, Hey, we share this commitment to scripture. We share the commitment to uh, the Bible really speaking to reality in, in all of its parts with fire <laughs> and changing us and, and reshaping our imagination. Uh, but we still land differently. And so, yeah, we're, I guess we're talking through that. Yeah. yeah, very good. Thank you. Yes. Um, one thing that Joe has done, uh, my friendship with him has forced me to um, think carefully about very uh, uh, imaginative questions. Um, so it's been interesting to listen to the way that, that Joe has processed things. Okay. Uh, before we get into the questions, I do want to just sort of um, follow up on what Joe ended there with and say, 
it is refreshing that as we go around the room um, and we're listening to everyone's story and we're hearing everyone make a movement of kindness and grace towards each other when they differ, I think that for me, that's the most important thing. I don't think that uh, learning, no matter what context it takes um, place in, is ever uh, conducive with frustration and hostility and anger and anxiety. Um, and so I really want to emphasize to anybody that's listening to this podcast or watching this on YouTube, uh, if you're going to have conversations on this subject, find you a good group of men that are secure enough in their own ignorance um, to uh, have a conversation from a seat of humility uh, because uh, pride um, never works out for anyone. All right, so let's start with uh, hermeneutics. And Sarah, we'll start with you. I'll throw this out there. Um, all right, so we everyone really talked about this in their, in their uh, introductions, uh, but what priority does modern science and archaeology what do those take in interpreting scripture um if it became clear that scripture requires young earth creationism would you i guess the question is would anyone with an old earth opinion uh would they be required to abandon modern or um, young earth uh let me re-say this would I'll just begin again. If it became clear that scripture requires young age creationism, would you abandon modern science or abandon Christianity and why? Well, I mean, this is an interesting, it's an interesting way of framing the question. By the way, you may hear my dog snoring and this is mm -hmm. the result of the fall. You know, if, if, if Adam had never <laughs> fallen, the dog would not snore. So, um, but it, this is a question that I posed to myself very quietly um, many times while I was a theistic evolutionist, um, because, you know, as Brad described, you kind of, after making the transition to theistic evolution, there's an expectation that the problems will get easier and easier and easier, and then you're going, you're going to stumble across an interpretation of Genesis, and oh, that's finally, I've come across it. And in many false experiences like that, but then you would sit with them and it would be like, oh, well, that doesn't really work. I think um, the evangelical community has collectively had that kind of experience with John Walton's uh, Lost World of Genesis 1. It, was, <laughs> it, it, it caused a, a big stir initially. And now people are like, well, none of this really makes any sense. But, um, uh, but I'd raised the question to myself. If it, had become, if it became clear that there really was an intractable conflict, what am I more confident in? And honestly, just speaking for myself, but I know that there are others who have had the same experience because I've talked to them. I deep down in my heart of hearts, I was more confident in the conventional scientific paradigm than I was in Christianity. That doesn't mean it was more important to me. I hated the fact that that was true about me, but I felt like the arguments for the conventional paradigm, paradigm were weightier to me in terms of their epistemic weight than, uh, uh, than was the, um, what scripture definitely seemed to be teaching. Um, so, I mean, that, that's where I was as a theistic evolutionist until the very end, uh, you know, Brad, it's funny that the way that he talks, like he could be me in like my last few months <laughs> of, of, of theistic evolution. So let's have him back on in a year and he'll, he'll talk about how Sarah from Hamilton enlightened him and <laughs> happy year. That's really, that's really funny, Sarah, that you say that because the first time I talked with Brad about this, he, he said the same thing to me. He's like, oh, your young earth creationism is just where I was a couple of years ago. So it's like, mm, <laughs> yes. we're, we're all like, we're all like telling each other, oh, I'm the evolutionary form of you in yeah. a couple of years. So, <laughs> well, yes, just so yes. you know, guys, I used to be all of you. So, uh, you know, I am, <laughs> yeah. I am the, I am the telos. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, Shane. Um, any you want to riff off of what Sarah said, but same same sort of question: uh, the priority of modern science um, and archaeology in our interpretation of scripture, and if uh, the scripture requires young age, what do you abandon? What do you modern science or scripture? And or is that even a false sort of dichotomy? But anyway, how about before I answer, Dale, did you mean to turn your screen off, your camera? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
All right, cool. Well, I have a picture on my screen. Of a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that, that that was an accident or what. Um, yeah, so this question, uh, I, I raised this question in part because I was inspired by some of the stuff that Seraphim had blogged about and, and partly because it's one that resonated uh, very deeply with me. I think this is at some level what's going on in my own reasoning. Uh, I, you know, being well enough acquainted with um, old earth paleontology in particular, and the, the mm. story that's told about how all the animals that we find in the fossil record, animals, plants, whatever, in the fossil record go together, how they succeeded one another, how they evolved into one another and so forth. Um, and the fact that this story is, you know, um, over a billion years long for some of the macros macroscopic stuff, uh, that, um, that makes it clear to me that I, I, there's a more robust and well thought out explanation for all of this on the old earth side, because science has been working at this very um, diligently and spending a lot of money and time on it for generations now. And so there's going to be a lot more books. There's going to be a lot more fine-grained systematic knowledge um, or theories explaining these sorts of things. So I, I don't think you can look at, you know, young earth creationism with its six guys basically who are doing this seriously <laughs> with no, with no serious funding, you know, in their garages and, and think, oh, well that should equal or, or look as impressive as what's going on in, in the old earth side. Um, now, I say that as a preface for the fact that I think a lot of people approach this question. They see an intractable difference between the two. They approach the question. And I think there is strong, you know, a strong intractable difference, not between science well done, but between science as currently understood. I think um, you, if you're a young earth creationist, you have to say on some level, uh, some really serious level that modern science has taken a serious wrong turn for a couple of centuries um, that geology biology, especially, but also, um, you know, uh, anthropology, archaeology, astronomy, to an extent, um, all of these physics, even with our understanding of radioactive decay, all of these things have have gone down a road that we actually need to seriously reform. Um, and, and I'm actually fairly comfortable with that being a possibility. I, I put it out there as, uh, you know, a candid admission of the state of things as I see them and the fact that we would have to build alternative models that would better explain the data as young earth creationist if we wanted to sort of overturn that paradigm um, just discounting all of the social and, and institutional stuff the, the hurdles that we have to deal with um, but I look at that and I and I ask myself has that sort of revolution happened in the past and I see on a you know on a scale model level scientific revolutions, and changes and overturned paradigms throughout the history of you know natural science and, and going back to when it was called natural philosophy um, that make a lot of sense of that to me and some of those have been you know in the direction of Christian intuitions like for instance the revolution it very recently in our you know in science's understanding of the universe actually having a beginning and not being eternal um, so that was clearly in a Christian direction the uh, the uh, revolution from Ptolemaic to you know, you know, Copernican uh, theories of how the cosmos work. Uh, that was in a, in what many people consider to be an intuitively non-Christian direction. Um, I, you know, the, the scriptural evidence that's usually adduced for geocentrism uh, in my mind is extremely weak. Nothing on the level of what you'd find in, you know, for young earth creationism. But um, nevertheless, that was a, an overturned paradigm that literally remodeled the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And so I look at, you know, where we are, I see the results of a lot of our science um, the way that the, the authority of scientific institutions is severely abused to the point now where we're even seeing, you know, the transgender movement and everything. And I'm not saying that transgenderism and, and Darwinism go together. I'm saying that the authority of those institutions is used as like a, as, as like a, a whack-a-mole hammer to shut you up if you question anything. Um, I look at that and I look at the assumptions that underpin most of it. The fact that neo-Darwinism, which is rooted in materialism. And I don't think you can even divorce it. I don't think there's a way to consistently divorce neo-Darwinism from materialism. I think that's a philosophical prior of neo-Darwinism. If you um, look at that uh, underpinning assumption and you ask yourself what, you know, for lack of a better word, what worldview is at work here? What, um, what, what outlook on reality is at work here? And I think it's very clear that there's a monistic, materialistic, anti-Christian 
outlook on reality at work there from the very beginning. And so I'm not surprised that a, that a number of assumptions or a number of conclusions that contradict what I read in scripture emerge out of that paradigm. Now, the question is, am I, you know, at this point, given my epistemic trust in the Bible over my epistemic trust in modern science, am I sort of dismissive about the whole scientific enterprise? And I have strong um, draws, uh, strong pulls in that direction, mainly, you know, through my interest in um, extinct dead things, you know, beautiful, amazing, exciting, thrilling creatures that, that used to live on this earth that I've always been fascinated by that those need an explanation. Um, and I do look at the, the massive edifice of the old earth science. And I say, uh, well, clearly there's been a lot of work done there. And there's a lot that I can't, I can't directly respond to given my complete lack of training in the area beyond, mm -hmm. beyond regular curiosity. And then I look at the young earth um, descriptions and I'm like, well, okay, you know, charitably speaking, as I would be want to do, this is a, a this is a science, a scientific model building enterprise in its early infancy. Like this is a fetal thing right here. Mm. Uncharitably speaking, someone from the outside would say, oh, this is just a bunch of religious, you know, quacks trying to justify their, um, their way of seeing the world because their ancient text says this. So mm. yeah, I do think there's a conflict and I would be, I'd be comfortable with the whole scientific paradigm basically having to be rejected in favor of something that um, I read in scripture. I think there will be a revolution of some kind in our understanding. And that's not to say that, um, you know, different types of science are, are on, on equal footing. Obviously I great, have great trust in medical science. I have great trust in <laughs> engineering. Uh, I have great trust in all the, you know, in, in all what, of what creationists would call the observational sciences, the things that we can actually, um, you know, uh, repeat indefinitely in a laboratory um, that are not based on reconstructing past events. Um, I, I, I think that stuff. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I think that, um, you know, the question is not just, you know, is the creationist or are creationist models in their infancy? But I think people sometimes say, well, you just have promissory notes, but there's nothing wrong with promissory mm -hmm. notes when there's a precedent of fulfillment then you have a high credit rating. And I think what we have to do is we have to ask the question, relative to the amount of effort which is being invested, because even though there isn't a lot of effort being invested, there is a, there's enough effort being invested that we can start to ask the question, is there movement? Because when you're a theistic evolutionist, as we've discussed earlier, you're looking for the problems to get better in a hermeneutical position. Um, and they get worse and worse and worse. And you can look at origin of life research. They give promissory notes, but the thing is, it's not that there's no motion, it's that the problem with a naturalistic account for the origin of life keeps getting worse, going in the wrong direction. So what direction is it going in in creationist model building? Well, I think you can just look at the kinds of anomalies that we have in the conventional scientific models. You know, just in the past 10, 15 years, initially what seemed to be an exception to the rule with things like dinosaur soft tissue and proteins and that, um, which Todd Wood, even as a creationist, was very skeptical of its value as a creationist argument. He's recently come out and said, well, now it looks like this is the rule because they've started breaking open fossils and they keep finding it happen over and over and over and over. Or you can just look at some of the quantitative predictions that have been made. And I think quantitative predictions are really valuable because the you're picking one number out of what is an infinite set, right? And so the uh, probability of you getting an exact hit by chance is very, very, very low because it's so precise by definition. You can go to the Wayback Machine and you can see that the RATE project, the RATE project, made quantitative predictions about the amount of helium which was going to, which was in fossils based on their theory that radiometric decay had been accelerated. And they published them and they got it exactly right. And in fact, to, to the credit of conventional science and conventional scientists, they presented this at a, a secular uh, scientific conference because it was quality work and they were cordial of which I think is an object lesson that, you know, there is, there are ideological things that are going on, but even, you know, a, a straight up atheist or naturalist, if you're cordial, um, they will give you a hearing if you de demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. And so I think there's been a lot of positive movement in the right direction in terms of the amount of effort that's been invested that gives us reason to think that the young earth uh, science 
when it's got people who know what they're talking about, they have a high credit rating. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Bradley, what one, one uh, thing off of what Shane said, uh, it is funny when I hear people appeal to the Copernican revolution is sort of like, this is when science took over and God was being discredited and we got rid of that medieval approach to the cosmos and the silliness. Uh, C Copernicus, if my memory serves me correctly, and I could be wrong. So if somebody facts, facts checks me, I will repent in dust and ashes, but he was a teacher in the church. <laughs> uh, he was he was a communicant member of the church at the time that was part of the, the teaching class. Um, so his faith actually informed his um, studies, which I don't think a lot of people that appeal to him understand. So anyway, all right, uh, Brad, um, yeah. priorities, <clears throat> modern yeah, science. So, so it, Kurt Wise has a great quote here, a very interesting quote. Uh, on basically someone posed to him this exact question, like, so what if it's a choice between the science and the Bible? <clears throat> uh, and his response, I'll read it here, is uh, Kurt Wise, by the way, is like the number one top creationist, a uh, young earther uh, geologist for a good reason, like he's awesome. Um, so Kurt Wise says, although there are scientific reasons for accepting a young earth, I'm a young age creationist because that is my understanding of the scripture. As I shared with my professors years ago, when I was in college, he, he stud, uh, studied under Stephen Gould at Harvard. Um, if all the evidence in the universe turns against creationism, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a creationist because that is what the word of God seems to indicate. <clears throat> and I agree with that. That's my stance too. Um, I mean, I mean, hypothetically, in terms of the principles there, I'm an old earther, but if that really is what scripture teaches, then I will definitely affirm it no matter what. And I, I in principle, can't believe that there would actually be uh, a contradiction between the natural order and scripture. Uh, and I don't think Kurt Wise would either. I think this is strangely worded. I think what he really means, and what I would say myself, is uh, if I really could think of a possible remote way to interpret the nat uh, to interpret the natural science as consistent with scripture if it really seemed to my mind to be a contradiction i would go with the scripture and i think that's what kurt wise means that's certainly what i would say um so that's the priority it's got to be scripture and the only way i can even be an old earther is to say well somehow it must not contradict scripture and in terms of the you asked a more subtle question, what priority do modern science and archaeology take in interpreting scripture? <clears throat> I'll just say modern science, not archaeology. Archaeology shouldn't have anything to do with it because archaeology is such a sketchy discipline. It's Archaeology is interesting because sometimes you find cool historical things, but it means absolutely nothing if the archaeology doesn't back up a claim that's in an ancient book. Probably the ancient book is right. Even if it's a secular, not secular, even if it's not a Christian ancient book, the ancient book is probably right, even if there's no archaeological evidence. <laughs> You've just Anyways. triggered the archaeologists that listen to our program. So thank you, brother. Thank you for that. <laughs> they deserve to be triggered. Um, <clears throat> anyways, the how does modern science uh, play into how we interpret scripture? I think it does play in. And I, I think the Copernican example is a good way to talk about how it does. Uh, it can't contradict scripture. Uh, these two books, the book of creation and book of scripture, they have to both be true. Uh, so if we encounter what seems to be a conflict, uh, what we ought to do is go back to each of them and read both of them more carefully and be like, now, which one of these did I misunderstand? Like, we look at some evidence from astronomy and think, wait a minute, geocentrism might be false. Um, let's go back to scripture. Maybe I misinterpreted scripture. Maybe I was making too much of these geocentrist verses. And then it turns out, oh yeah, I was making too much of those ge geocentrist verses. It turns out that's just, you know, phenomenal, uh, phenomenological language. It's super, super easy to read scripture as consistent with that scientific claim. So that's an example of science motivating us to be more careful in how we interpret scripture but not at all contradicting scripture. It's uh, really the sort of conclusion that someone could have even 
without the scientific claim, but it just happened to be the science that motivated that careful exegesis. Uh, it's very different, say, if you to continue with the geocentrist example, if you have like the book of Enoch and try to read that as compatible with heliocentrism, like that ain't happening. Book of Enoch is so totally flat earth, uh, geocentrist all the way. Like there's a little portal where the sun comes in and goes out. And like, it is very detailed in how it talks about its incredibly flawed cosmology. Um, mm. And that's not at all what you see in scripture. What you see in scripture is careful wording that is very easy to affirm with uh, really any kind of astronomical understanding. Mm. It so happens in that case. So uh, that mm. is how science relates to scripture, I think. It is it uh scripture trumps but uh science can motivate us to read scripture more carefully sometimes sometimes we might go back to scripture and say nah scripture's not budging here i must uh, got to go back to the science and adjust that one like and sometimes that's the case <laughs> yeah yeah and i think that's the natural human instinct is sort of oscillate between our own phenomenological experiences and say wow the world is x and then we come over to the scriptures and we're like, ah, oh, that norms this thing that was, you know, at first glance, uh, not making sense. And then we move back into nature and it's like, aha, that makes it much more ordered and beautiful, actually. Um, and that's just the way that we develop. I think God has designed it that way because providence is wiser than us. So, Joe, talk to us, brother. Oh, I got to say, too, just adding yeah. to what Shane said, elite science uh, the scientific elitism and the institutionalism of science, it's got to go down. Like that's, it's stultifying to the scientific disciplines that it engulfs. Uh, it is, especially since World War II, when the scientific establishment became highly institutionalized and government funded, it's so bad. And there have, every field of science has suffered because of it. We, we need to go back to the old ways of non-institutionalized, non-government funded science. It's a big deal and distorts a lot. <laughs> there was an article a couple of years ago, I'll just say, um, and maybe you remember it, it was a while back, it was while I was living in Virginia. So I'm just remembering, you know, reading at my desk there at work, but it was maybe in the American Spectator. And it was a, an observation of how, it was like a, a cumulative observation of how scientific studies, especially in the medical world work, and they came to this, you know, startling conclusion that basically everyone's everyone's cooking their results in order to produce the most dramatic, marketable, publishable, publishable thing possible. And nobody does checks for negative yep. results. Nobody goes back and checks established results. They just want something that's going to be sexy so they can publish it. And that, that's like a perverse incentive at the heart of, of peer review that corrupts the whole process and like at that point you got to ask how well how deep does this rabbit hole go and then how many other fields can yeah. we say this you drew a distinction between observational science and the other forms of science earlier i'd go even farther and say really the only branch of science i trust is engineering uh because that's <clears> the only one where if they fail it breaks and sometimes people die and so on like all the other branches that are not engineering <laughs> i'm kind of skeptical of them are you an engineer brad uh no i, okay. I mean i do software programming but i don't I think was gonna psychologize that answer if you were so <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, no. the archaeologists listening are like no ours is the most reliable yeah, archaeology, <laughs> Indiana no, Jones. not even archaeologists yeah. would say that man <laughs> um, um yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. I suppose like part of my own narrative life project on this question is that I, I radically reject any trump card approach between the Bible and the, the natural world and natural philosophy uh, and observations from the natural sciences. I don't think that I do agree with what Bradley just said that that observations from one can shove us back into the other to interpret it, but then shove back over here to interpret. And there's always that dialectical, dialogical process going on. Um, but I think to say this is what these rocks, this is what the best interpretation of these rocks is, it, it has to be answered as it were to use not in its uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using a, I'm using this phrase superficially, but has to be sort of solved in its own domain. 
what does Genesis 1 mean is going to be solved by really thinking mostly about things that we would normally do in reading a text. What do these rocks mean is going to involve a good uh, uh, set of principles by which we would decide how would we decide that. Uh, and now when we talk about epistemic whatever, you know, epistemic Trump, epistemic trumping to me, I just, I more or less don't think that's a very useful game. I think it, I think it works in the abstract. I actually don't think uh, in one sense, I could say, sure, the Bible is clearer than the natural sciences at a hermeneutical level because words are clearer than things. That's the level at which I'd say the Bible mm-hmm. is clearer than, than the world, in a sense. Nevertheless, I, I, I don't think we're typically in a situation where the Bible is saying something with such radical clarity that could not be seen another way. And, 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 and unless we're talking about something as, as specific as neo-Darwinism, where it's doing, where it's doing something the opposite. And if that conflict, if I perceived myself to be in that conflict, and let me free flag again, I do not perceive myself to be in that conflict. Um, I think people actually overstate the extent to which one thing would trump the other. So for instance, um, People tell themselves, here are my epistemic hierarchies, but I, I think that's not always true. Here, here's an example. If God came down to, if, if what you quote, quote, thought was God came down to you in a cloud and said, you're not talking on a podcast right now, right now, <laughs> you would not believe that. Now, now we might say, well, that can't be God because God can't lie or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. But my point is, there are certain things you believe that you it would have a hard time not believing, even if you found a Bible verse that told you not to believe it. And, and, and I'm kind of getting back to Sarah's point about the Bible's real. It connects to reality. And that means you don't just in a, I don't think the, 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 the commitment to scripture is the sort of thing that says, um, uh, uh, even if everything here was ridiculous, if it said two and two is five, I'd have like the the way that, uh, you know, the Jesuits believe in the Pope. If the Pope says black is white and white is black, I'll believe in it. Actually, because the Bible is written by God, we expect uh, that it doesn't do that because it's about reality, a reality that we know in, in part, not entirely, but in part through another mode and on its own register. Uh, and so I don't, uh, so I, in, in a way, this question always winds up, what, what, I, what bothers me, I suppose, maybe the question behind the question where I, where, that I might get to is, certainly I don't, uh, um, certainly if I felt like the sciences through proper analysis or whatever, factoring in and offsetting for worldview factors and all that stuff, but just the, you know, putting all the, the pieces together, the sciences seem to suggest an old earth and I go back to the text. I have no instinct to make the text fit that view. I want the text to speak precisely as the text and only as the text. And I want this to speak precisely and only as itself. And if the messages seem different to me, uh, uh, I would I would feel the need to resolve that. And I'd just go back and forth between them until I felt like it was resolved. You know, that's what I would do. I don't think a trump card approach would ever happen. I just don't, I don't see that as wise. I'd just prefer to say, like we do in a bunch of things, like it, within the sciences themselves and interest scripture itself, there are plenty of things that the church can still say, like, we see this, we see that, we kind of have some sense of how they fit together, but it's not always like, perfectly clear uh but then i'd want to but but um yeah yeah so i i just yeah that's i think that's all i want to say um um i can't but oh the last thing i'll say the last thing i'd say is nevertheless i just don't even i just don't find myself in that position i don't feel like there's some great conflict that needs to be resolved because i don't see the i don't see the young earth creationist position as the obvious and default position of the text itself uh, and so I don't, I don't perceive, uh, uh, actually I lied. Last thing I'll say, uh, I do think it's useful to study the history of the church on this question, because it is interesting yeah. to see uh, through the history of the church. And I think, I think, um, David Livingston and, uh, I know Ron numbers, people can debate whether he's useful, blah, 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 but they both collected several edited essays of, you know, you know collections of historians of science that are fascinating because they go to things like the Galileo affair, 
or even um, uh, 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 heliocentrism in the reformed communities. This is a significant debate in the reformed communities and the lines, mm -hmm. like the actual arguments that went back and forth between, uh, you know, uh, Wilhelmus Abrakel, for instance, and others, uh, were very, very similar to all of the statements about young earth creationism and its exegetical and scientific principles. And what's interesting is you see a debate very similar at many junctures in the history of the church. And generally, I think the church always took uh, kind of that back and forth approach. It was like, we're not, you know, natural philosophy does what it does. The Bible says what it says. And you dialectically engage until there's a synthesis. And we're probably at a stage in human knowing also worth saying on a massive amount of fronts uh, where we experience this kind of epistemic uh, lack of synthesis uh, in a way that is that is maybe historically unusual, which is why I'd wanna finally add, now I will not be lying. It's the last thing I'll say. <laughs> I am also skeptical of institutions, but I don't share my brethren's kind of absolute skeptic. I don't know what should happen to the institutions and to science. I don't know if it should all burn down. It's, I, 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 I don't know them enough to feel that it's unrisky for me to say, I know what that means. To, for that word to escape my mouth and say, science should go back to this versus that. I am. I don't wanna speak anything like that too willy nilly. It's, I can say, I see things in science that are problematic. I don't, I don't have a sense of what's to be done about it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, so we're sort of like getting at the, we've talked about, uh, you know, if you had to choose and then what does that look like and how do you wrestle through that? Well, let's just talk about, and, and Joe, you mentioned the, the tradition there. And I think that's an interesting uh, thing that we should also talk about. So let's fuse the two and let's talk about Genesis. Um, is there a discernible genre shift uh, somewhere in the early chapters of Genesis? Uh, and if so, where's that at? Right. This is the this is a big question that you that you have to resolve because it's like at what point does the genre shift from let's say a um, a true myth, your or you know a different genre of literature into an accounting of the true historical um, sequence of events, um, and how does the tradition understand that shift? Is there an understanding? in the tradition of a genre that they would have typically understood Genesis to be in. And does the tradition see a shift in the genre as we move out from Genesis one? So Sarah, we'll start with you, brother, go ahead. So there are several things I wanna say about this question. And the first thing is that I am skeptical of the way that the concept of genre is deployed by both young earth creationists mm -hmm. and theistic evolutionists, old earth people um, in this mm -hmm. argument, because what, ultimately is a genre. A genre is a certain pattern of qualities that you can identify in a work of literature that will frame your expectations for what that book is going to do. Uh, but oftentimes when you write something, you're not thinking, oh, I'm writing in this genre. Right? But the way that it's uh, deployed in discussions about biblical interpretation is I think that uh, uh, genre distinctions tend to be reified so that we have a genre of apocalyptic literature mm. and Daniel is apocalyptic literature and Philippians is not apocalyptic literature and never the twain shall meet. But then Paul <laughs> says things in Philippians like you are shining stars. And well, this is an epistle. This is supposed to be, he's being literal because it's not apocalyptic, but that's an apocalyptic quote unquote, uh, a turn of phrase. It comes from Daniel 12, the righteous will shine like, or the wise will shine like uh, the stars of heaven forever. And well, where's that come from? Well, that comes from Genesis, where God says to Abraham, you'll be as the uh, stars of heaven and the dust of the ground, heaven and earth. Um, and that's history. And so all of these things kind of roll together into each other. And I think the distinction among these genres and the reification of those distinctions goes together with the, one of the most important hermeneutical principles in interpreting scripture and interpreting the world, which is that symbolism is not even remotely in tension with history. And it's not just that it's not in tension with history, but symbolism is innate to the actual structure of creation and in an identifiable way. And I will go to the mat for in an identifiable way. And the reason I'll do that is because Jesus says to the apostles, when I fed the 5,000, how many baskets are left over? Well, when I fed the 4,000, how many baskets were left over? Seven. Well, hello, 
Don't you get it? Don't you get the message? Jesus expects the disciples to have been able to identify not just that there was a meaning, but the specific meaning in the number of baskets that were left over after he fed the 5,000 and 4,000. So that wasn't in scripture yet. I think God expects us on the basis of the kinds of things that are written in scripture to at least uh, work at seeing what he is doing in the structure uh, of the creation. And so that Mm. is a really important thing in these genre distinctions, because what apocalyptic literature is doing is it's opening up the heavenly court and it's showing us directly what's going on in the, in the, uh, in the affairs of the heavenly state in uh, uh, the, the, the history of creation. So we shouldn't be surprised to see highly symbolic uh, 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 phrases and characteristics in historical narrative. So having said that about the concept of genre, um, I think number two, uh, the issue here about young earth creationism is not six day creation. Okay. So six day creation, if, if Genesis one, if the framework interpretation was correct, which in my humble, but accurate opinion, it is not, if the framework interpretation was correct, (laughs) Um, I would still be a young earth creationist because the reason that people feel an uh, an old earth is probably true is because of the geological and the the, the physical evidence. Um, But in Genesis 6 to 9, you have a flood which covers the entire planet. And that would have left evidence. It would have left evidence. And if there's no evidence for a global flood, that is on the top of the sedimentary record interpreted according to the conventional interpretation, well, then the alternative is naturally it is the sedimentary record or a large portion of it that has been misread. So Genesis 6 to 9 actually feels the larger problem for the conventional reading of, of the history of the earth than Genesis chapter 1. Mm-hmm. Um, also, we have in Genesis 1 to 11, the genealogies, which are not like the other genealogies in the Bible, because they not only give the age of the people there, but they give the age of the father at the birth of the son. So even if we have a lineal relationship that is indirect, even if it's a grandfather, which I don't think is true, but even if that were true, um, the ages don't change. Uh, 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 Lamech is still whatever age he was when Noah was born, even if Lamech is Noah's great, 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 great grandfather. He was this age when Noah was born. And that means that the chronologies, which are built in here, uh, are very difficult to pull out. Um, and then we also have little details and things like uh, in, in Genesis 11, where we're told that our fox sod was born two years after the flood. It's one of these like throwaway details. But if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to construct a chronology. So I think there's a lot of prima facie evidence there that there is a chronology going on. There is a change in pacing between Genesis 1 to 11 and the rest of Genesis. But I do not get the sense at all that there is a a genre change or a change in our historical expectations. I think that sometimes people feel that there's a very sharp change because the image of the text that they have in their mind would conflict with the natural or prima facie historical reading of Genesis 1 to 11 with the rest of it. So for example, Meredith Klein has said that it seems that the era of the patriarchs is happening long, long, long after the time of Noah and all that kind of stuff. So that's prima facie evidence that um, there are large gaps in the in the chronology because this is supposed to be so long afterwards. But I think that's just because that's the image we have in our mind of the patriarchal period. I mean, there's an ancient Jewish and Christian tradition that Melchizedek is the same person as Shem. And they didn't see anything particularly crazy about that. Or just look at the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh has uh, the hero going to visit Utnapishtim, who's the flood, the hero of the flood. And I think we see here kind of a window into a very archaic period of post-flood human history, where it's said that the flood hero, the guy who survived the flood, who knew what the world was like before the flood, is still out there. And people would go and make pilgrimages to, to see him. But I, I think that um, the image we have in our mind of the patriarchal period actually is one which is not very long after Genesis 1 to 11. And then finally, on the question of whether it's the same kind of historical narrative, uh, Abraham dies at 205 years old. I mean, I, I don't know that people have, have, or most theistic evolutionists who feel Genesis 1 to 11 is mytho- mythological, have really grappled with the implications of that. People generally today do not live to 205 years old. Um, it looks like all with the change we have, it's a change in pacing because you see uh, after the flood, you have human lifespans, which are cut about in two uh, or in half. And then actually they're cut in half again at the Tower of Babel, because you'll notice that it happens when Peleg is born. We have another 
having of human lifespans. And then it declines kind of reasonably and believably throughout the patriarchal period. And then you have Jacob who dies at 147 years old, but it's still, we're still kind of in a world between the world of Genesis 1 to 11 and the rest of the Bible until we get to Joseph who dies at 110 years old. But even Job, I think, dies at 140 years old. Um, so it's still a different kind of world than the world that, we, uh, that we're familiar with today. And I think to the extent that there is a mythological aspect to Genesis 1 to 11, if one wanted to say that, one would have to say that kind of flavor is still there in the patriarchal period. And I'll just throw this out there just as kind of an interesting factoid. I think if you have it in your mind that this is the world very soon after the flood, that there's some interesting things you notice in just the history of Genesis. You'll notice that the patriarchs, they have a, they use caves quite a bit. And I think it's kind of striking what we know about the, 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 the uh, Paleolithic um, and i.e. the Stone Age where there are cavemen. It seems that there's a recent cultural memory where caves were very, very important. And then you see Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a very um, uh, dramatic uh, geological cataclysm, I think is, is what the text is describing. That seems to me to be describing a world which is still kind of rocking back and forth after the catastrophe of the flood. Then you have all this, these climate problems and then there's a famine which covers the whole face of the earth. Uh, so I think there's some interesting things in Genesis which suggest that it's really not so long after uh, the catastrophe of the flood. But no, I don't, I don't think that there is a genre a shift in uh, the way that William Lane Craig and, uh, and others who agree with him have argued. All right, Shane. Uh, Sarah, I appreciate that you rolled basically the next two questions into right. this one. So we're kind of dealing <laughs> yeah. with these as a unit. And those questions are, you know, about the, the genealogies and then about the historical value or the, uh, the lifespans and then the genealogy. So those are kind of the same thing we're talking about. Um, I won't say much on this one because uh, I agree with what Sarah said, uh, other than to point out that, um, you know, as a lay person, I approach the Bible uh, in a very intuitive way way and one of the in the one of the intuitions that guides me um and that I, I think has a basis in the teaching of an expositor like jim jordan uh is that a correct reading of the text will give you much greater fine grain detail um and unlock a great deal more meaning in the text in, in other words it will it will juice a lot more out of it so if you've got the right understanding of whatever you want to say genre intent of the author, the, the historical or non-historical, you know, apocalyptic nature of it, um, more content will begin to emerge and it will emerge in a convincing way that's demonstrable, that links together and that is, you know, mutually reinforcing. Um, when I compare the different approaches suggested in modern exposition of Genesis 1 through 11, because this is the prime, the primeval history. This is sort of taken as a unit. Craig treats it that way. That's why we're treating it that way. Um, consistently, a young earth view, a well-formed young earth view draws vastly greater quantities of data, meaning, and significance out of the text on a whole number of levels. Um, you know, most of all, theologically in terms of the New Testament, but, but also historically in the terms that, that Sarah was talking about there a, a moment ago, whereas the um, old earth or the, I shouldn't say old earth, the uh, mytho historical or the, the looser interpretations of it that want to see this as um, communicating something other than straightforward, you know, brick on top of brick history uh, demand that we zoom back and take a much, much lower resolution view of the text. You can kind of feel the sensation of zooming back and thinking, oh, okay, well, all this is trying to tell us is, and then we're given the moral of the story, which is that God is creator or that he judges sin or that, um, you know, he put the nations where they belong or something like that. The fact that, you know, our fact said was this old when the, or, 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 you know, was born this many years after the flood literally becomes a throwaway statement. It literally becomes useless, as far as I can tell, theologically. I cannot see on an account that says there, there was no global flood and he was not born, you know, and that proximity to it. And these guys weren't actually living this quantity of time or this amount of time. I can't see how if you, if, how if you relativize all those details and say, well, no, no man ever lived past 800 years old. My goodness, that's nonsense that you can take a fine grained approach to the text. It seems to me you've got to basically view it the way Craig is viewing it as a very loosey goosey mythology um, with some general points. And so 
I've yet to I've yet to hear a good argument for why it is better to approach scripture in a way that is low resolution as opposed to a way that's high resolution. So that's that's kind of my main thought on those three questions. All right, Bradley. So so if you're asking, is there a discernible genre shift? And mm -hmm. that's basically uh, kind of like Sarah mentioned, it's it's equivalent to asking, is there a shift in how we should be interpreting? these passages. And um, I currently think, yes, there's a shift in how we interpret these passages, mainly just because by default, I'm uh, being pushed by the natural science in a direction that forces me to say, yeah, I think we've got to interpret these passages differently. Because Genesis 1 through 11, those are the chapters that deal with the universal narratives, the those are the stories that actually affect everybody on the planet. And it's only Genesis 12 and after that focus in and narrow in on just Abraham's line. <clears throat> and once you get to something more narrow, then all bets are off and anything goes. And you can, you can say, oh, conventional archaeologists uh, object that camels were not domesticated yet in the time of Abraham. Therefore, this is not historical because domesticated bones of camels have never been found in that strata. And you can say, so what? Uh, mm. They were wild camels that were tamed or domesticated camels took a while to get those different bones or you just haven't found them yet or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you can easily defend <clears throat> uh, anything Genesis 12 and after uh, in terms of natural history. In science but once genesis 1 through 11 that's the universal stuff that's the really really packed universal narratives which uh commentators often spend a lot more time on because they're so packed there's so much going on there in those first 11 chapters and because of that those are the more difficult to interpret uh and because of that difficulty i say yeah well it seems we have to interpret them differently somehow um, I don't have a problem personally with people living a long time. Um, I don't find that uh, a priori to be an incredible or fantastical thing. And like lobsters live a long time, so why not people? Um, I even have ideas and, uh, on how that might have happened. I, I think there might be people alive right now, maybe 160 years old or older in obscure places where... Uh, uh, longevity researchers ignore them because, oh, it's only their baptism certificate that says they're that old. You can't trust the baptism certificate. <laughs> uh, okay. But, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a gentleman um, or, uh, who uh, is, I think he's in India or was in India, and I haven't looked too deeply into it, but it does seem to me that um, there is evidence that shouldn't be dismissed that there was at least one person who was like 500 years old who died maybe a few decades ago. So, uh, and there are hmm. old Chinese dudes. You know, some of these are guru type people living on the top of mountains. Those are the more sketchy narratives. We're like, okay, I can understand why this guy might have lied about how old he is. But then some of them are just, well, here's the old farmer, the, you know, corner of the village here he's yeah. on his fourth wife who lives on a diet of powdered donuts and whiskey uh always <laughs> yes yes now, usually it's something like he just he has his milk goat and he just drinks his milk and his bread and that's all he eats ever i don't know why right. Right. but anyways I, I don't find it weird at all that people uh, might have lived that long or it's not a priori ridiculous thing i, I would really like to do what on my to-do list is to do uh long-term experiments with mice uh testing out some longevity theories. I, I want to have the world's oldest mouse. That'd be so awesome. Um, that, that's the most Belschner life goal, I think, <laughs> one could imagine. <laughs> I can okay, get so to Joe, five years. <laughs> yes. So Joe, um, yeah, shifts in genre. Also, one thing that Joe, mm -hmm. if you feel equipped to answer this, um, but don't, don't feel the need to, but something Belschner said was, there's a sort of narrowness that begins in Genesis 12 that's not in Genesis 1 through 11, which is why he sees there must be a shift in our sort of hermeneutical approach to yeah. the text. Um, and, and I'm curious because it seems like there is a very narrow uh, 
narrowness to in Genesis 1 through 11, precisely in the genealogy, in the precision of the genealogy. And so anyway, um, in terms of ages and things like this and processions of families. Yeah, I think lines. the idea of narrowness there is like the nevertheless, if you're taking, say, the standard narrative, those ge those would be common ancestors because they're descendants of Noah. And then Noah is Shem, Ham, Japheth, everybody's through them. And so that's a, you know, the, the scope in terms of the human race that this is about is universal. Uh -huh. And then we narrow through the Semitic line to, to Abraham and at the end of Genesis 11 and beginning of Genesis 12. Yeah, I mean, Saro picks up the the note that most people identify, which is you know the, the 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 quickness of the narrative. Genesis one to eleven is covering however long you take it to be. It's nevertheless a very long period and a very short amount of time as a text, and so and so whole events and whole periods are being sort of smashed together and spoken about in extraordinarily dense ways. Um, and none of the details, none of the details don't matter. That doesn't mean I think we know why all the details exist. There are, in fact, lots of Old Testament passages with lots of details that commentators, Jewish, Christian, and contemporary look at <laughs> and go, I'm not exactly sure why that detail's there. And then maybe a Jim Jordan comes along and helps you. And sometimes an ancient Near Eastern guy will come. And by the way, to a <laughs> in principle, I should be the guy who loves John Walton because he plays with all the right toys. He says things that I like, like the text was written for you, but not to you. I think that's probably a good interpretive tool, that kind of thing. But the way he actually plays with all the toys, all the toys. He, he frustrates me enormously <laughs> all the time. His actual conclusions are always like very same, I think, reaction that Brad had to this book by Craig. There's a lot of things I can appreciate about it. And yet it seems very, actually, it's funny when I, when I want to say what's wrong with such things, Brad, I say it's engineer brain. There's not very much imagination <laughs> here. Uh, it's just very like, this is myth. This is not myth. Obviously these belong on the myth side. These belong on the not myth side. So I'll just back up very quickly and uh, the specifications say clearly say hard dome sky. Okay. Yes. We got a hard dome sky. Uh, and I'm not, <laughs> you know, I, you know, there's a whole lot that we could unpack. What What is the actual ancient cosmology? Did they believe it? Does that matter? Is it just phenomenological, et cetera, et cetera? There's lots of books to say. In principle, I, I agree with Sarah. Like, to talk about genre in some way is already to have a modern conversation. Maybe talking about, before recent times, people aren't talking about genre as such. Um, uh, but uh, one if we wanted to kind of re-descriptively use the phrase genre, I think what we would be talking about is what are the functions of the portions of texts? What are they doing? What could we, and I think Sarah said that right as well. Uh, when the, what we could anticipate would be the audience that would be receiving this text originally is reading it, what are they expecting that that text is supposed to be doing to them and why? I think, I think we could, uh, I think we could say, what I am expecting out of Genesis 1 to 11 and 12 and on are different. Uh, because of what the text itself is doing, we could then go to internal evidence. We, we talk about the genealogies. There's so much to say there. I actually think there's a lot of evidence the genealogies are a little, little odd, sort of like the beginning of the genealogies in Matthew 14, 14, 14, you know, this sort of thing. Uh, in Genesis uh, 4 and 5, there's 10 and 10. There's a lot of numerological significance in the in the uh, in the genealogies. There's also a lot of numerological significance, apparently, in the very ages in the genealogy, such that if you add up all the numbers of the of the of the the genealogical folks together, you you wind up with something that actually does have significant astronomical significance, which was a very very common symbolic frame of reference in the ancient world, uh, and you could add to that uh, numbers in the flood account. I think that you know all of a sudden in the flood account it becomes significant that on the fourteenth day of the fourth month and the seventeenth day and so, you, know, you know that kind of thing. Why don't we care about those here and here? Is it because all of a sudden real history? matters and its specifics or is there a uh, a function now uh, or is that or are those numbers speaking about a historical event but the, the the dates are actually added for for a reason that whose vector is to the reading audience a, a vector that i would anticipate the reading audience would actually pick up and know that that's how it's functioning so it's interesting shane says a. Uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, if we t whatever unveils the text is the approach to take. And I actually think one thing that does unveil the text, uh, the last, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, very, very briefly before I 
respond to that, I think what I'd want to say as a baseline is I, I do think we have to expect that Genesis 1 to 11 for its original hearers is talking about uh, deep historical time, commonly remembered historical events. God created the world. There's, a rich, there's, an, there's original parents. Uh, they fell. Uh, there, are, there are these generations after them. There was a flood. Uh, in other words, there's a, there's a, uh, and it really, we, we know this in part because this is a commonly remembered historical framework. But as, as we can, one thing we can see when we compare, for instance, uh, take the Tower of Babel in the scripture, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mountain, it's a tower. In another story, it's a tree. Uh, you know, which one is historically, quote, quote, historically accurate. In one sense, I, I think even Sarah points this out on his website, in the ancient world, those symbols are just very related to each other. Uh, does the ancient audience care <laughs> whether right. it's this or it's a tree? That doesn't mean the Tower of Babel and this event did not occur in the separation of languages. And I think uh, the fall is an interesting one. Say, taking Adam out of the side of Eve, or uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I could talk about several things in the, in the fall narrative and the Adam narrative. And what I'd want to ask is, which of these details just don't mean anything if there's not a historical referent. In a sense, that's the way I'd want to answer it. If it's not talking about an event, does the symbol even work? And the answer, I think, for a lot of things in Genesis 1 to 11 is if this is not eventish in character in some way, the symbols themselves literally don't mean anything. The Adam story can't just be talking about your personal psychology. But there are elements in the text that if we can say, like, look, Here's a, a kind of symbolic set of vectors that this, that this particular depot could be understood against and the event could be inflected through. Uh, then, you know, possibly at least that particular detail is functioning on a different register than an attempt to communicate historical details to you. Uh, and, and some of it, I just, uh, uh, the, the last thing I'll say there is some of it, I'm not sure it's easy to tell. So, for instance, an example I would use is Eve coming out of the side of Adam. Uh, commentators for a long time, God does nothing arbitrarily. The church fathers and commentators for a long time have tried to say, what's the significance of that? On the one hand, we could just say it happened. And yet, you know, you have the famous Matthew Henry quote, right? God didn't take Eve out of Adam's head or his feet. He took him out of the side because of the blah, blah, blah. Maybe that's exactly, maybe that's all that's going on there. But um. Part of the problem, it seems to me, with even reading the text and trying to answer this question, in what way is it functioning historically? In what way is it functioning uh, sort of sort of uh, uh, in other ways, on, on other vectors than historically, is that I, I, I think we are deeply underestimate or uh, overestimate ourselves if we think we have entered the ancient mind. Uh, 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 I'm not sure we fully grasp the associations that are very natural to the ancient mind, which I would add are not just primitive. I would add that they're actually un they're, they're actually get us into reality in some deep way. But nevertheless, don't ping us at our stage at our moment in history with the same visceral quality where those differences are easily divvied up. Uh, but somebody even like a Mike Heiser can help here, right? That serpent, you know, so one thing Mike Kaiser will point out is when the serpent comes along in the garden, for instance, um, it's very clear this is Satan, the whole biblical narrative, yada, 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 uh, an angel falling, the, it's very clearly uh, a statement about angelic, uh, uh, historical angelic intrusion into the human project. But the image of the serpent is an interesting one. And Heiser will go down to like the spelling, uh, <laughs> the spelling of the word, uh, the symbol of the serpent, what, how many associations does that, and especially when you factor in these are ancient texts, probably coming from oral cultures that are passing down these things, preserving history, the way an oral culture in deep time, perhaps even prior to writing, <laughs> preserves stories. How do they preserve real events? But how do they talk about those events? You get to, you know, maybe stages where we're writing. Um, uh, uh, and what do single words mean? How many vectors when you're literally chiseling something into a stone that's going to stand for hundreds of years, how many vectors does every word in that stone actually function on? Uh, and I think once we get into that ancient time and start throwing in a little Owen Barfield's original participation to have some fun in the mix, uh, you know, maybe we generate the, a sufficient vantage point to even ask the question well, <laughs> uh, to be honest with you. So, yeah. Uh, I really, um, I want to push back 
really hard on the idea that there's any implication whatsoever in numerological or symbolic details that uh, there is something less than historical going on. Because I think what we're seeing here is the innate character of what history is. Uh, you know, one of the numerological details that I think we see in the chronology of the flood year is that Noah comes out from the ark on a Sunday because this is yeah. the resurrection of the world. Now, Jesus came out of his tomb on a real historical Sunday, and that was not arbitrary. It was symbolic because this is God's world. This is God who is managing everything. And all of these symbolic and numerological details that we see in the scripture are a consequence of the fact that every second of historical time is governed by and sustained by the God who reveals all things through the logos. So there are logi in every historical moment. And we are created in the image of that logos. I remember there was a news story several years ago about a young, a young gentleman who was on this little fishing vessel. Uh, and this is somewhere in South Asia. He was a young Christian man. And uh, the fishing vessel was moored down and uh, there was a storm that came out of nowhere. It unmoored the vessel. I mean, this was not meant to go out anywhere like the deep sea, but it was driven out to the deep sea. All he had was the Bible and a spear. And he was out there praying the Psalms uh, for 49 days. Now, if that was found in a text, a person would say, well, 49 days, seven times seven, this is a sabbatical theme. And in fact, it is a sabbatical theme because that young man was in the same history that Noah was in. And the God who unveils all things in real historical time reveals himself both in historical events that are communicated in scripture and in historical events that are recorded outside of scripture. I think one of the interesting things, you, you mentioned the Tower of Babel, um, uh, there's a typological relationship, I think we would all agree, between the Tower of Babel and the Day of Pentecost, and the Day of Pentecost is a great, great wind and everything. And it's yeah. very interesting that if you look at traditions from around the world about the Babel event, they consistently feature a great gust of wind at the right. end of the event, knocking over the tower or tree or shaking out all the world's nations or languages from it. Uh, Josephus gives us that detail, but it's found in traditions as far afield as Aboriginal Australian memories. Right. Now, that is a symbolic detail. And it is a typologically resonant detail, which is not found textually. It's found only in historical time. And so I think it's not just that these things are not intention. It's that we have to understand them together. And numerological details, I want to emphasize, are part of the wiring of the world. Um, uh, the, the, one of my favorite examples is uh, the solar number. The solar number is 33. So 33 is... is uh, in, in a very widespread set of cultures associated with the sun and solar symbolism. Now, the sun is 333,000 times more massive than the earth, and the diameter of the sun is 33.3 or .3 times 33, the diameter of the earth. Uh, this is something which is an objective feature of the world because it's a ratio. It doesn't depend on you know, what unit of measurement you're using. Uh, and it is concordant with traditional symbolism in a way that nobody would have been able to know because you couldn't measure the, 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 the mass of the sun in the ancient mm -hmm. world. Or you have the, the, the moon. The moon has a 29.5 day cycle. It's the first of the seven traditional planets. And then you have Saturn, which is the last one. It has a 29.5 year cycle. And that's just you know out of a grab basket of lots and lots and lots of numerical details, which are wired into the stuff of the world. Um, if, if people are interested in this, I would recommend, uh, there's a book, he's not a Christian. He's, I think he's a, a perennialist of some sort. Um, Robin and Heath's book, The Matrix of Creation, on all of the numerological details that you can find by studying the ratios of the planets to each other. And as you can see in Genesis 5, you know, Enoch is 365 years old when he's taken into heaven. Uh, and then there are lots and lots of celestial numbers that are found throughout the numbers of the patriarchs. But I personally have found, at least I think I found, um, in my life and the lives of those I know, lots and lots of things which really stick out as uh, as something which present themselves as, as symbols on a prima facie level. And that's not evidence that, you know, oh, God is, is especially ordaining my life because I'm such a special person in these symbolic ways. No, because this is mundane in the most basic sense of that world, of that word. Mm. The mundane world is symbolic and it screams symbolism. The heavens declare not only that God is, 
but the heavens declare his glory, his specific splendors and beauties. So, so I think it's important that we not understand them um, in any way to be mutually exclusive, intention, or even suggestive that we're dealing with something less than an historical account. Yeah, I think my response to that would be, I think you can, I think that's possible, but I think it cannot be merely insisted upon prima facie. In other words, uh, I think it's true that our lives often reveal that. But if I found out, if I Google after this event and realize, oh, Sarah got the circumference of the sun wrong, I'm not going to lose my faith over it because it's not like it wouldn't be a big, like I wouldn't feel like this, anything you just said was even undermined in terms of the truth about the symbolic ordering and the providential use of numbers in life and the in symmetries in the cosmos. But it's like, if I can't discover the, the, the numerical significance to the synodical orbit of Pluto, uh, I'm not going to have a crisis. And I think similarly, when it goes back to when we go back to the text, it's uh, my claim wasn't that uh, the points I made show that this is not intended to be historical. It's rather that they function at least on another vector than historical, which does not mean the historical is not there. It doesn't even mean it's not there precisely communicated in the same word. Perhaps it really was 365 years when Enoch was translated up to heaven, like quite, quite literally. Uh, perhaps the symbolical and the historical are just totally fused with that number. My argument is rather that if there's a vector of meaning that is independent, I, uh, uh, let me say uh, the word independent is, is the wrong word there. If there is a, a vector of meaning, which is not uh, reducible to the historical, if I could put it that way, uh, then, in, then I think you can, you can ask the question, uh, is this detail, uh, does, this, does this detail belong in the text simply by virtue of the association it creates in the receiving audience? Uh, and is it something that they could see and say, yeah, that makes that. Uh, um, and I, again, like I'm, I don't have any examples to hand, but I, uh, if, we, if I was trying to be an apologist, I'm sure I could come up with plenty of instances where we use numbers in precisely this way. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. So I don't, it's not that I'm denying the thing. It's rather, it's not that I'm denying the connection. And it's not that I'm saying the connection isn't often, in fact, quite exact. It's rather that if details can function on vectors and be explained without being reduced to the historicity, it seems to me that we can say this text means something. God is communicating that can be an interpreted by a symbolic mind reading the symbolism of his creation uh, uh, without saying that God uh, is necessarily uh, 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 adding to this particular sentence historical weight as it were, it precisely as the number. There are times when that's true, but there's not, but but I think that's not something we can just say dogmatically as though it's obviously the default reading anytime a number shows up. I, I don't, I don't okay, want to give Sarah, a, yeah. I want to give Sarah a chance to respond. And then I think this is a good transition into anthropology. So yeah, uh, Sarah, I'll let you have the last and, word, Sarah here, and then we'll go to the other one. Yeah. You're our guest. Yeah, it, it, it's clearly the case that you can have symbols which don't have an historical significance in a particular context. I mean, the parables of Jesus are kind of the cliched and obvious and, and legitimate example of that kind of thing. Uh, nevertheless, I think that one of the things that is being communicated by the use of these symbolic numbers is precisely a message about what history is at bottom. And so while you would still have a symbolic quality that you could derive from the text, even if it were not historical, I think you would lose something because I think when it gives us an historical detail, in this particular way, you know, people say that the author of Kings was selective about what his what uh, historical events he chose and all that kind of stuff, and that's fine. But I think what we're being shown in Kings and Chronicles and all the historical books is not just one perspective, but we're being shown the real causes of things in the world. Why does the biblical author choose these details and not those details? Because he is telling us that it is idolatry, not geopolitics, which is the driving force of. Israel's exile. And so I think the fact that it is historical and it is symbolic uh, brings us to the very kind of character of history. And I think part of this is just the kind of basic fundamental question. Sure, it can be symbolic and not be historical. But when we have an account like the flood, I what for what reason would we say um, hermeneutically that this is something like a parable or, or, or it is not uh, historical? Um, so yeah, yeah. I would yeah. very briefly, just for text, you recommended one text. I would, I'm sure you've read this, Sarah, but I would recommend uh, 
I'm probably going to get his name wrong, but Michael Lefebvre's recent book on this, uh, I think who, who answers precisely the question you just asked very well. Why, if this, why would Genesis start saying 17th day of the seventh month? Uh, if it was not meant to, uh, if it was not meant to say something with, about precise historical time, I think his answer to that is very, very, in fact, almost uh, demonstrative. <laughs> but uh, 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 yeah, yeah, the, I can't remember the name of the book. Michael Lefebvre, uh, the cosmos, the calendar of the cosmos, something like that. Uh, calendar uh, of the cosmos. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Look up him. And it might be good, Joe, to throw these books, anybody that recommends a book in the show notes, Calendar Cosmos. Um, okay. Liturgy so of Creation. Yeah. Liturgy of Creation. Okay. Yep. Very good.